Um, and I shall resume. Thank you for your patience. I would like to thank my colleagues. That was my first remark for pointing out that I was muted. I would like to thank Nanyang Technological University for uh, presenting uh, this series and for uh, furthering our scholarship. They have been immensely supportive to me um, and to my work here. I have been a scholar of the Communist Parties of the Philippines for the past 10 years. And uh, during that process, my scholarship has developed uh, to sort of expand and narrow in on a particular topic. When I first launched this project, I thought, like a number of scholars before me, that I would uh, write a history of the CPP, the Communist Party of the Philippines, from its founding to the present, whenever that wound up being when I finished my research, and that I would base myself largely on interview accounts. And in the process, I discovered that I was treading a path that had already been tread by prior scholars. Uh, I found, however, what became the heart of my work when I dug into the contemporary written record, uh, which was voluminous and which opened up horizons that were previously unknown. In the process, I discovered that I could not begin with the founding of the CPP, but had to go earlier into why it split from the PKP and who were its earliest members. And at the same time, I could not possibly go up to the present. There was much too much to write. And thus, in the end, my scholarship became about how there were two communist parties who were antithetical to each other and how both had a role to play in the imposition of martial law in 1972. The written record is diverse. It is leaflets, it is flyers, uh, it's pamphlets. Many of them are one sheet ephemera that were produced by a various organization in the broad milieu known as the National Democratic Movement. I digitized nearly 10,000 pages from various archives, attempted through painstaking work to reconstruct what day each document was written on, and then situated into a broader narrative, which I reconstructed on the basis of reading the contemporary newspaper record. I read through eight different daily papers every day over the course of six to seven years as well as the news weeklies. This is why my research took so long. I'm gratified to see that there was such overwhelming interest in the topic that I am presenting today. First is tragedy, second is farce, Marcos, Duterte, and the Communist Parties of the Philippines. An element, however, of the interest in this stems from a controversy that erupted over the last week as the founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines and remained still his ideological leader, Jose Maria Sison, known as Joma Sison, began directly attacking me over social media. In the week from August 18 to August 25, he posted doctored images of me. You can see me here with a clown nose and clown hair, an I love Trotsky pen, and a book about distorting history. He also wrote that I was a pathologically rabid anti-communist and a CIA psy war agent posing as an academic Trotskyite. This, I would like to point out, is libelous. He has no evidence to claim that I am a CIA psy war agent. He went on to state that the futile attempts of Trotskyites abroad, like Joseph Scalise and in the Philippines, to blame the legal democratic forces, as well as the revolutionary forces, for the rise to power and current criminal rule of the traitorous, tyrannical, genocidal, plundering and swindling Duterte regime. This morning, the CPP issued a special issue of their flagship publication, Ang Bayan, which has been in existence since 1969. In this uh, edition, which was exclusively dedicated to my work, Sison again referred to me as a paid agent of the CIA. Again, libelous. He stated, I have been aware of the rabid anti-communist and anti-Stalinist writings of Scalise for quite some time, long before now. I have ignored him because American comrades and friends have told me that he was already well exposed as a Trotskyite and as a paid agent of the Central Intelligence Agency, paid to focus on the Communist Party of the Philippines and my writings and make a career out of attacking and misrepresenting these. He went on. I certainly have no intention to go into all of this, but I'll read one more. Scalise is both a liar 
and incorrigible anti-communist agent of imperialism and reaction. Indeed, he is practically a wild informer for the benefit of the Duterte death squads. This is again libelous. Sisum makes no serious attempt to engage with my scholarship. He thinks that he can dismiss my work by labeling me. Now, I would like to point out that this bullying in the pages of the special issue of Ang Bayan carries with it a very real threat. The party has long been associated with the assassination of political opponents, and the name Trotskyite in the mouth of a Stalinist is a threat of physical liquidation. History on this is very clear, both in the Philippines and around the world. I will not, however, be bullied by this, nor will I be baited into engaging in his politics. I intend to go ahead with my historical lecture. In the face of this attack, I have received an outpouring of support from academics and journalists alike uh, who have issued public statements in support of me. I am not going to name you because I don't want to incur any further ire upon you uh, from the various Facebook warriors who have been attacking me, but you know who you are and I am grateful to you. What is more, the World Socialist website published a statement in defense of academic freedom, historical truth and my scholarship, and I am grateful for this defense as well. Prior to this controversy erupting, I wrote a public statement as several activists associated with the National Democratic Movement, the broad group of political organizations that follow the political line of the Communist Party of the Philippines had come under attack by the Duterte administration, and two at least had been brutally murdered. This is what I wrote on August 14, I would like to read it. Those who are acquainted with my scholarship know that my historical work is trenchantly critical of the role played by the leadership of the Communist Party of the Philippines and of the various organizations affiliated with its political line. I would thus like to be explicitly clear on this point. I unreservedly defend the party and those associated with it from the attacks carried out against them by the state and by paramilitary and vigilante groups. The murder of Randall Echanis was an attack on the working masses of the Philippines and marked a dramatic step toward police state rule. The defense against the danger of dictatorship requires the unity of the working class for its own independent interests. My opposition to the CPP and its allied groupings is based on the fact that they have consistently opposed the political independence of the working class and have forever sought to subordinate its interests to the formation of an alliance with a section of the ruling elite. This is the point I intend to substantiate in this lecture. I concluded, it was this perspective, the program of Stalinism, that led the leadership of the party to embrace Duterte, facilitating his rise to power and downplaying the danger of dictatorship. My opposition to the leadership of the party and its political program is thus a defense of the interests of the working class for the same fundamental reason that I oppose the party, defense of the working class. I publicly declare my defense of those associated with the party from attacks by the state and its paramilitary forces. Now, neither CISO nor anyone else has acknowledged this public de declaration, although a good many academics and the broad public responded to it very warmly. CISO claims I'm an informant for the death squads. Make no mistakes, the death squads of Duterte are a very real threat. The war on drugs on a national level commenced as Duterte took office. In fact, there were initial steps towards these death squads, even as he was in the initial phases of before taking office, as police and paramilitary began going around murdering. There was a very powerful image, which you can see here on July 23, 2016, a young woman cradling her murdered partner. The uh, cardboard reads, I'm a pusher. He was publicly murdered and his corpse was left in the streets. The victims of the death squads are overwhelmingly poor. They come from shanty towns, they are tricycle drivers, 
fishbowl vendors, petty criminals, uncharged of a crime, and they are murdered every night. They are carried out, there are murders carried out by police without warrant, and even more, there are murders carried out by paramilitary organizations and vigilante groups. The most recent count that I was able to see of the official police count of those killed by the police was 6,000. But we know if we read the press that there are several times more killed almost every day by paramilitary organizations and vigilante groups. The numbers are very difficult to, uh, to come up with an accurate estimate at present, but given the police official numbers and given the proportion that we know between the paramilitary death squads and the police, somewhere around 30,000 victims over the last four years seems to be a fairly safe estimate. This, I believe, can bear the label genocide a genocide against the poor in the name of a war on drugs. Doubtless you will have seen in the press internationally that Duterte's war on drugs is overwhelmingly popular with the population. I think when future historians or perhaps sociologists dig into this, they will find a far more complicated narrative. The same surveys that find around 80% support for the war on drugs return another figure that is very rarely cited. Eight out of 10 Filipinos fear getting killed in the drug war. Now, if you were being surveyed and you admitted that you were fearful for your life, do you think you would simultaneously claim that you opposed the war on drugs? I think making a public statement of any sort in opposition to the war on drugs might be seen as something of a death sentence. I don't believe that the war on drugs is immensely popular. Among the claims that Sison made in his public attack on me was that it is, quote, an outright lie that the CPP supported the Duterte regime. I'm not going to read everything that I put here in the text, but Sison wrote, only a Trotskyite can interpret peace negotiations between two warring parties as support for Duterte and betrayal of the people. That's not my argument. It's not the peace negotiations. It's much more obvious than that. It is an outright lie that the CPP supported the Duterte regime in his extrajudicial killings of poor people for two years. An outright lie that they supported the regime in his extrajudicial killings. I want you to bear this formulation in mind as I review the evidence. Now, what I would like to do with this talk is above all focus on the historical parallels to an earlier period, the period from 1969 to 1972 and the rise to power of Ferdinand Marcos. But given this outright uh, an explicit claim that it is a lie that the CPP supported the Duterte regime, I feel it's necessary to first review the contemporary record. Many in my audience will doubtless recall that the National Democratic Movement and the CPP were quite enthusiastic about Duterte when he took office. This is now constantly denied. A commenter on my Facebook post the other day made a remark that I found particularly accurate. He said, it feels as if we're being gaslighted. I think there's some truth to the characterization. Before I review the record, I'd like to make one more point, and that is this. I do not know, nor do I particularly care, who is and is not a member of the party. This is not information I'm privy to. And if it were, I would not disclose it. Beyond the public faces of the party, this is not information that I have. We do know, however, that there is a broad mass movement in the Philippines in a number of organizations. I am not alleging that these organizations are secretly controlled by the Communist Party. I am not red tagging them. I am claiming rather that they have a common political line. I will explain what that political line is in considerable detail, but in the end, it amounts to an orientation to finding the progressive section of the national bourgeoisie and allying with it. And the National Democratic Movement has not only always had this orientation that it shares with the CPP, but it has somehow or other always managed to find the same progressive representatives. 
Who is Rodrigo Duterte? Duterte was a member of the youth wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines in the 1960s, the Kabatang Makabayan. He was in the 1980s a leading member of Bayan, part of the National Democratic Movement. We know this because Joe Masison himself said so. But he rose to power in the southern city of Davao, where he rapidly rose to prominence as a particularly vicious, one might say thug, the head of death squads. And it was in this capacity as mayor of Davao that then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo brought him onto her anti-crime commission. And he addressed in 2002 the anti-crime summit saying, summary executions of criminals remain the most effective way to curb kidnapping and illicit drugs. I'm going to single out but a few statements by Duterte because I want to be clear. There was no miraculous transformation of Duterte into a fascistic figure in 2016. His track record was crystal clear. The UN Special Rapporteur investigating this, the, the, the death squads in Davao under Duterte said, no one involved in the vigilante murders covers his face. In other words, these acts had official sanction. Everyone knew this. Hundreds of dead bodies over the course of a decade under Duterte's mayoral rule took place. The statement by Lucy Lagan, a congresswoman with Gabriela, part of the National Democratic Movement. In the Manila Times in 2009, however, appraised the mayoral role of Duterte thus. The mayor deserves our support. Those from outside the city cannot appreciate what the mayor has done to maintain the order that we enjoy. Duterte's brand of leadership has kept us safe and secure. Now there's some truth to this. The victims of the vigilante murders were not from the National Democratic Movement. They were not activists. In fact, even the CPP and NPA were not targeted. The targets were the poor, very much the same targets that now suffer under his presidency. Fast forward to 2015. Duterte has now been brought onto the national stage. He's been made into what is known in the Philippines as someone presidentiable. And in January 2015, he staged a press conference in front of a hammer and sickle flag that was hosted for him by the CPP and NPA and announced that if he were elected, he would abolish Congress, privatize government assets, including Social Security, and form a coalition government with the CPP. And he promised that Joma Sison would be made head of the newly privatized Social Welfare Bureau. Joma Sison, founder of the Communist Party, responded on Facebook, quote, Mayor Duterte should become president. Remember, it's an outright lie that the CPP supported Duterte. May 25, 2015. During a radio interview, Duterte was confronted with a Human Rights Watch report that over 1,000 people were killed during the late 1990s by death squads in his city, Human Rights Watch. He responded that I'm the head of death squads. He explicitly avowed this. And this is a famous quote. If I become president, that number will become 100,000. I will feed the dead bodies to the fish of Manila Bay. I have to say that a great deal of the press and figures, political figures in particular, that should have treated this as an outrageous statement and a warning, claimed that Duterte was joking. If the estimate of 30,000 that I proposed earlier is in anywhere near accurate, Duterte is attempting to keep his promise. In July of 2015, there was a wake staged for one of the leaders of the New People's Army, the armed wing of the CPP, the NPA, Leoncio Pital, Caparago. This was staged in Davao. There was no attempt to hide this. There were no questions of security. The CPP brought an immense crowd, bust them in, in honor of this revolutionary leader. And then they brought Rodrigo Duterte forward as the guest speaker. The flags read, Mabuhay ang nagkaka isang prente, long live the, the United Front. And Mabuhay ang Partido Comunista ng Pilipinas, long live the Communist Party of the Philippines. You can see hammers and sickles, armalites, and the picture of Leoncio Pitao. Doubtless they sang the Internationale, 
Bangon sa pagkakabusabos. Ladies and gentlemen, Rodrigo Roa Duterte. Bangon alipin ng gutom. It is an outright lie. The CPP supported Duterte. They had graffiti all over the city, promoting the armed struggle, commemorating the death of Pitao, and adjacent to him, and of the same size, was the face of Rodrigo Duterte. Duterte did, in his usual volatile fashion, something rather unusual. When the presidential candidacy period had ended, the time to, to declare your candidacy, he backed out. He was not running for president. And uh, a completely unimportant man, Martin Dino, would be running at the head of the party. Looking for someone to ally with, the National Democratic Movement latched on to Grace Poe, whom they had endorsed for Senate in 2013. Then, with a sort of stagemanship, Duterte announced that he had decided to re-enter the race, Dino stepped down, and Duterte campaigned for president. But ties had already been made. But in Mindanao and in the southern Philippines, Anakbayan, Anakpawis, and company did not campaign for Grace Poe. They campaigned for Duterte. You can see here a truck bearing the posters of Neri Colmenares, Anakpawis, and that's Duterte. Central to this were the figures associated with the, the front organizations of the party, of the National Democratic Movement in Davao, in particular, Ayik Casilo, who became representative of Anakpawis. Here he is campaigning for Anakpawis during the election. You'll notice the Duterte fist bump. They are not campaigning for Grace Paul. This is a campaign of the National Democratic Movement for the candidacy of Rodrigo Duterte. If you want to know where I get these pictures, what my evidence is, they've never seen fit to take any of this down from their Facebook page. Look for yourself. I've only taken a smattering. Again, this is Ayik Casillo's Facebook page. You can see he proudly proclaims the fact that he voted for Duterte. He and Duterte are in fact quite close or were. You can see him here whispering in Duterte's ear. There are countless pictures of them together, fist bumping, etc. The candidates from Mindanao declared their full support for Rodrigo Duterte. And among them was Carlos Zarate of Bayan Muna and Ayik Casilao of Anakpawis. The sign, if you can't read it, says, we as representatives of the people of Mindanao pledge our full support to presumptive president-elect Rodrigo Duterte. You can see on the inset, Carlos Zarate signing the endorsement. This again is in May. Some of the representatives of Bayan Muna and Manila were taken aback with the speed with which the National Democratic Movement turned to endorse Duterte after having campaigned for Poe. Sison took to Facebook to denounce them, writing, you don't just attack capitalists, we can work with nationalist capitalists, even as we talk to and persuade compradors. Our honeymoon is just beginning. We're talking to him. He's offered us positions. Sison delivered a particularly vile speech on June 10, 2016, an address to assembled youth leaders of Anakbayan uh, and a wide range of other organizations. I can't quote copiously from this, but let me give you a sampling. One, Sison claimed, while mayor of Davao City, Duterte has recognized and appreciated the role of women in public life has created facilities for women and children in need, and has demonstrated this abhorrence of violence to women. This is a staggering lie. Duterte is notorious for making rape jokes. Jokes along the line of having visited men who, who carried out rape, accosting them for not letting him go first. He wolf whistles female reporters during his press conferences. When the Communist Party of the Philippines finally had a falling out with Duterte, he made a speech to the military in which he called upon them to attack female members of the Communist Party by shooting them in the vagina. This is not a man who demonstrated his abhorrence of violence to women. 
I would add before I move on to the next point that CSUN is not exactly one to speak about the defense of women's rights. The party maintained a policy over the course of decades in which they disciplined female cadre if they were engaged in premarital sex. This was an attempt to not exclude some of its allies in the Catholic Church. What is more, women were routinely excluded from political leadership within the party. I know that there are some victims of these policies who are currently attending this meeting. Sison went on in his address to youth leaders. What is inside is a kind of coalition government between the party and the Duterte administration that involves the participation of the Communist Party, government of national unity, peace and development. The question therefore arises whether the national democratic revolution can be completed in the absence of a people's war. Now he didn't answer this question, but he did propose what precisely would happen to the new people's army in the event of a coalition government. Quote, revolutionary armed units can become guards of the environment and the industries under conditions of peace and development, integration of armed forces is permissible. A great many of the cadre of the New People's Army who have taken up arms, believing that they are fighting for a better world, are young people. Young people convinced that there is no other solution to the extraordinary poverty in the country. Many of them have sacrificed their lives. Sison is here saying that the armed wing of the party would be transformed into security guards in industry. Bear in mind, this is not under socialism. This is under national democracy. It's capitalism. Security guard and capitalist firms and integrated into the AFP, a body that has been responsible for the suppression and brutal torture and murder of the cadre of the party over the course of decades. Integration of armed forces is permissible. Now, no time elapsed under the Duterte administration before things became really obvious the character of the administration. AFP wrote on June 12, armed police are detaining crying children, bewildered drunks and shirtless men throughout the Philippine capital in a nighttime blitz that is offering an authoritarian taste of life under incoming President Rodrigo Duterte. Parents of children found on the street at night alone were jailed. Within the first week, there was already a body count amassing and it was making its way into the press. Meanwhile, the party was conducting peace negotiations. Now, I'm not criticizing the conducting of peace negotiations, contrary to what Sison said, but there's peace negotiations and there's peace negotiations. And when you campaign with smiling fist bumps, which is the quasi fascist salute of the Duterte administration, one questions the politics that underlie such peace negotiations. This picture was taken in June in Oslo. Joma Sison is in the gray suit and blue shirt. The National Democratic Movement didn't simply endorse Duterte, they endorsed the war on drugs. Einstein Resides, the Secretary General of Anakbayan, on June 26 wrote, we believe that Duterte's war on dangerous drugs and crime is a boon to the poor. A boon to the poor. Renato Reyes, Secretary General of Bayan, wrote on July 4, to put it plainly, he is an ally. While he admitted that Bayan has difference with Duterte, he argued that to be immediately confrontational every time the president said something disagreeable during the past month would have weakened the alliance. We should at least give him a chance. That's the concern. If we say you're engaged in a campaign of fascistic mass murder, it would weaken the alliance. Bayan produced for the inauguration of Duterte a statement, the People's 100 Day Agenda, which opened with the statement the Filipino people are elated over Duterte's nationalist and pro-people policy pronouncements. After Duterte's inauguration, they traveled and they were welcomed into Malacanang where they presented it to him. You can see him here holding the statement of how the people are elated at his pro-people pronouncements as they all raise fists together. This picture, Unity, with the smiling faces of Joma Season and Rodrigo Duterte, I took that off Joma Season's Facebook page. For some reason, 
He posted it multiple times and never saw fit to take it down. He began ending his statements with, long live President Duterte. I want you to bear in mind, of course, that it's an outrageous lie, an outright lie, that the CPP supported Duterte. Duterte delivered a State of the Nation address. It was a rambling, vulgar speech. Unfortunately, we're all too familiar with them now. Among his statements was something directly addressed to the military and to the police. I have to slaughter these idiots who are destroying my country. And he said, I told the military, if you see any criminal, shoot them. Even if they surrender with a white flag, that's just for war, not criminals. Shoot them. Show no mercy to them at all. Anakh Bayan declared that Duterte State of the Nation address with a breath of fresh air. On June 21, 2016, Ang Bai on the flagship publica publication of the Communist Party of the Philippines wrote, the people will completely support, puspusang susuportahan, the steps that Duterte will take to remove and punish the drug syndicates. On July 7, Ang Bai on declared, the CPP welcomes Duterte's call for cooperation with the revolutionary forces against widespread drug trafficking. Luis Halandoni declared in Ang Bai on in August, the relationship between the revolutionary movement and President Duterte is excellent. On July 1, Duterte, in a speech to the heads of the armed forces of the Philippines, issued an appeal to the New People's Army of the Communist Party, saying, quote, use your kangaroo courts to kill them, alleged drug pushers, and speed up the solution to our problem. The CPP responded on July 2 with a statement entitled, response to President Duterte's call for anti-drug cooperation which opened by declaring that the party welcomes President Duterte's call for cooperation with the revolutionary forces against widespread drug trafficking. The CPP stated that they share in President Duterte's reprehension of the illegal drug trade. A month has now transpired. The body count is in the hundreds. The NPA continued, or the CPP, Quote, the NPA is ready to give battle to those who will resist arrest with armed violence. You resist arrest, we're going to kill you. That's exactly what the vigilantes were engaged in. Cecil was interviewed on CNN the next day. CNN. This isn't hidden, look it up. And he announced that the party would be violently cracking down on alleged drug dealers. Asked how sub suspects would be accorded due process in the courts of the NPA, he stated that the people's prosecutor would present prima facie evidence in the form of witness testimony before, quote, revolutionary justice was carried out. I'll speak to this again later in my talk, but revolutionary justice and people's courts. In the 1980s, the party launched a series of internal purges of its own ranks, hunting out what they claimed were deep penetration military agents. With torture, and with alleged witness testimony, they murdered nearly a thousand of their own cadre. There are some survivors of these purges in this meeting today. It's an outright lie that the CPP supported the Duterte regime. I hope by now it is clear to you what is in fact an outright lie. It's an outright lie that the CPP did not. Now, this support and retraction of support and lies used to justify it are actually a critical element of the party's historic behavior. This is a point that I want to establish very clearly. The entire history of the party has been falsified by its leadership. If anything comes out of this talk, it should be a passionate appeal for historical truth. I'd like to point out one more instance of how the party and the National Democratic Organization supported Duterte. It is particularly galling to me. In the name of the Kabatang Makabayan, the nationalist youth, which was the youth wing of the Communist Party in the days leading up to martial law, the National Democratic Movement and the CPP awarded the Gawad Supremo Award 
to Rodrigo Duterte in honor of his nationalism. The highest award of the Kabatan Makabayan was awarded to two people and two people only, Joma Sison and Rodrigo Duterte. The young people who joined Kabatan Makabayan were in many ways the best layers of an entire generation. They were self-sacrificing, they labored ceaselessly. As I worked through the history of this period, I came away with a profound admiration for their commitment, for their dedication, and also a profound opposition to what the leadership did with this dedication. This awarding of the Gawad Supremo to Rodrigo Duterte seems to me like one final betrayal. In the names of those who fought against dictatorship 50 years ago, all of their suffering was turned into a tawdry merit badge to be pinned on the chest of a fascistic thug in order to facilitate a political alliance. I want to turn to the stuff of history. What was the Kabatam Mahabayan? What are the historical roots of the alliance with Duterte? Are there parallels that can be instructive to us? I'd like to start with Joe Masison himself. Not because this starts with an individual. Our story long predates Siso and it begins with the Partido Comunista in Pilipinas, an earlier Stalinist party. I'll explain precisely what that means in a moment. That was founded in the 1930s, established a large peasant wing, uh, carried out uh, or oversaw uh, a peasant rebellion that fought against the Japanese occupation and then subsequently fought against the newly independent state known as the Hook Rebellion and largely went underground in the 1950s. I cannot cover this history here. I want to cover in particular the history of the split in the PKP that led to the founding of the CPP and how, I argue, both parties facilitated the imposition of martial law. And in this rebirth of the PKP, out of its dormancy in the 1950s, in the split, in the founding of a new party, no individual played a more central role than Jose Maria Sison. His background is particularly instructive. He came from one of the wealthiest families in the country. His great grandfather, Don Leandro Serrano, controlled the largest estate in northern Luzon during the last quarter of the 19th century. Sison himself recounted that his great grandfather owned 80% of my hometown and large chunks of four other municipalities. With the profits from the estate, he quote, built the largest mansion in the province. With 25 rooms, it was said to have a total floor space of 5,000 square meters, excluding a dining hall that could seat hundreds, a chapel, and a four level storehouse that was the biggest in the province. And in case anyone thinks I'm misrepresenting here, that's a direct quote from Joe Masison's autobiography or memoirs or interview accounts. Don Gorgonio Sison, who married one of Don Leandro's daughters, was the last governor of Cabugal under the Spanish colonial regime. He became the municipal president of the town during the brief Philippine Republic and managed to retain his position under the Americans, becoming Cabugal's mayor. So during the Spanish occupation of Spanish colonialism, during the brief Philippine Republic and under the American imperial rule. He changed his title three times. By 1921, the Sison family estate included vast tobacco holdings worked by an army of tenant farmers, as well as the seaside barrio of Salomage, which was one of 22 sites in the country reserved as a possible base for the US military. Sison's families included uh, embodied feudal privilege with peasant clients, sprawling land holdings adjoined and divided up by intermarriage. He had a vast nexus of familial connections. Two of his uncles were congressmen, Joma Sison. One was the Archbishop of Nueva Segovia, and his great uncle was the governor. One of his other uncles was president of the University of the Philippines. Another uncle was the head of Comelec. The front pews in Sunday mass were reserved for his family. Peasant tenants of their estate came each day to his home to deliver land rent, to ask for seeds, to do menial tasks around the house, and to plead for special consideration. All of this shaped Sison's psychology. His mother, during what is a charming interview with, Graf, uh, with Graphic Weekly in 1970, declared that her son, whom she called Ching, used to order the maids around. More than any of my other children, 
Maids had to wait on him constantly. He never did things for himself. Even in the bathroom, he would call the servants to hand him his towel, his clothes. But, and I think this is critical to understanding the class outlook that informs the role that he came to play, this world of privilege was disappearing. Don Leandro's estate had been based on rice, tobacco, indigo, and magwe. These commodities fared poorly in the 20th century. Sugar became a monocropped commodity of immense significance, but indigo and magwe were replaced by synthetic dyes, etc., and synthetic fabric. Rice largely shifted to Nueva Ecija. Tobacco came to dominate the family holdings and it could not sustain their former wealth. Looking to shore up the family holdings, Sison's father wrote a letter to his uncle, Yari, asking if he could become a secret agent for the government. This letter is housed in the University of Hawaii in the collection of Sison's brother, Ramon Sison. And I have a fragment of it here on screen. In 1949, he wrote, I have learned from reliable sources that Secretary Sotero Baluyot, who was one of the arch enemies of the Central Luzon peasantry, according to Ben Kirkleviat, is employing secret agents of the Department of Interior in pursuance of the present campaign against dissidents in Central Luzon and other parts of the Philippines. He's in reference to the Hook Rebellion. Sison's father, looking to shore up the family holdings, applied to become a secret agent to suppress the Hook Rebellion. The other image I have here is a listing of the family holdings. I won't go into it, but it's copious. It goes on and on and on. Again, housed in the University of Hawaii collection. I digitized the archive there with the assistance of a friend. The declining financial means meant that Sison's horizons were somewhat circumscribed. He was still a child of privilege, but his siblings and he pursued a less feudal and more urban existence and of decidedly more limited means. They were, in a word, petty bourgeois. Sison's siblings became a doctor, a dentist, and a technocrat in the Marcos administration. And Sison himself aspired to become a, a lawyer, go to Harvard, and become a political leader. He pursued his undergraduate and then graduate education at the University of the Philippines, where his uncle was president of the university. His uncle secured for him funding from the International Cooperation Agency, the predecessor of USAID. Sison's graduate career was funded by USAID. And it was during the course of his graduate career that he began to develop a political perspective. It was a political perspective shaped above all by the ideas of claro im recto. Recto has shaped the thought of an entire layer in the late 1950s and early 1960s, calling for nationalist capitalism. He was addressing a fundamental problem that confronted the economy, which was that in countries of belated capitalist development, the economy was controlled above all by the Americans and it was shaped to their interests. And he articulated rather eloquently the interests of Filipino capitalists. Here he is in a speech to the Cavite JCs, 1957, February 24. The industrialization of the country by Filipino capitalists, and not simply the prevention of industrialization by foreign capitalists, exploitation of our national rich resources by Filipino capital, development and strengthening of Filipino capitalism, not foreign capitalism, increase of the national income, but not allowing it to go mostly for the benefit of non-Filipinos. This was Recto's fundamental concern, the development of Filipino capitalism. And measures were taken along the lines of this through the, the Filipino first policy of the Garcia administration. But because the privileges of American capital were enshrined legally by the Americans into the laws of their former colony, the targets of Filipino first were overwhelmingly the Chinese business community. They were scapegoated, their assets were stripped from them. And in the end, none of the problems that Recto sought to address, the development of Filipino capitalism, were solved. The young people who were drawn to the program of Recto began to recognize that if Recto's vision was to be achieved, it required the impetus of a mass movement behind it. It was not sufficient 
for it to be the program of capitalists. It had to become a broad mass program. In 1965, shortly after the founding of Kabatal Mahabayan, and shortly before Sison instructed Kabatal Mahabayan to vote for Ferdinand Marcos, he delivered a speech in front of the US Embassy, in which, according to the Manila Bulletin, he told the audience, quote, we are siding with Filipino capitalists. This was his fundamental perspective. He articulated it very clearly in a statement called The Nationalist as Political Activist, 1966. In terms of class tendencies, material interests, and ideology, he said, the left wing would be occupied by the working class and the peasantry. This is the left wing of the population. The middle wing embraces three strata of the so-called middle class, and these three strata can themselves be described as left, middle, and right. So keep in mind, in the middle, there's a left, a middle, and a right within the middle wing. The left middle wing is occupied by the intelligentsia and self-reliant small property owners, whom we may call the petty bourgeoisie. The middle middle, the nationalist entrepreneurs, whom we may call the national or middle bourgeoisie, and the right middle, the merchants who are partially investors in local industry and who are also partially compradors. The right wing is composed of anti-nationalist forces, such as the compradors, the landlords, and their rabid intellectual and political agents. What's the task then? To tilt the balance for the purpose of isolating the right wing, composed of the enemies of progress and democracy, it is necessary, therefore, for the main and massive forces of the workers and peasants to unite with the intelligentsia, small property owners, and independent handicraftsmen, win over the nationalist entrepreneurs, and at least neutralize the right middle forces. The resulting unity is what we call nationalist or anti-imperialist and anti-feudal unity. The fundamental task for the workers and peasants, the overwhelming majority of the population, isn't to fight for their own independent interests, but to win over the middle middle, the middle middle, the nationalist bourgeoisie. But this is a hard sell, because what Sison is effectively promoting is trickle-down economics. It hasn't received that name yet, this is not yet the era of Reagan, but the claim of recto, and in Sison's earliest articulations it took the same form, was that if you improve Filipino capitalism, you will improve the lot in life for everyone, including the working class. And let's be honest, telling a worker, support your boss, it'll be good for you, that's not a very good sell. Sison's graduate career ended and he traveled to Indonesia. Uh, he was facilitated in this by a member of the Indonesian Communist Party named Bakri Ilyas. And there in Indonesia, he worked closely with the overwhelming, the very large, I should say, PKI, the Partai Komunis Indonesia. And over the course of his uh, half year stay there, he learned what I am calling the program of Stalinism. And I would like to explain what I precisely mean by that. Stalinism isn't simply the mechanisms that I think are popularly associated with the name. That is to say, show trials, purges, um, etc. These things are all part of Stalinism, but they are expressions of Stalinism. Stalinism is first and foremost a political program, and the historical record bears this out in spades. It was a political program that articulated the interests of the ruling bureaucracies in first Moscow and subsequently in Beijing. Uh, as they came to feel that their interests were best served not by promoting world socialist revolution, but by the development of the national economy of the Soviet Union, which was what funded and served and stabilized their privileges. In service to this end, they put forward a political line that was fundamentally antithetical to all prior Marxism, something that Lenin had never dreamed of. Socialism in one country the idea that you could build socialism within the borders of a single country. The idea of Marxism was that socialism had to be a step beyond capitalism and thus had to build on the highest achievements of capitalism and among these was the world market. Socialism could only be achieved on a global scale. This was no longer the perspective that was being put forward by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. This then is the first and core component of Stalinism, socialism in one country. 
Now, not all of the Communist Party adopted this perspective. Stalin was fiercely opposed on this by what was known as the left opposition under Leon Trotsky. Trotsky put forward the program of permanent revolution, the idea that revolution could only be carried out through world socialist revolution, not socialism in one country. And that the task, therefore, was to organize workers and peasants around the world to fight for socialism on an international scale. But Stalinism, in service to the program of building socialism in a single country, needed to have trade ties, diplomatic ties with capitalist powers. It needed a market for its goods. It needed the source of industrial goods. How do you secure such things? How do you negotiate arrangements? Well, thanks to the success of the Russian Revolution and the uh, heritage of Marxism, the Communist Party under the leadership of Joseph Stalin had an immense political capital, the cadre of Communist parties around the globe. And they instructed these cadre, rehabilitating an old theory put forward by an opponent of the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, of a two-stage revolution. The argument was that in countries of belated capitalist development, there, the tasks are not yet socialist. The tasks are first to achieve national and democratic measures, land reform and so on, immensely important tasks. But you can't launch into socialist tasks until these tasks are completed, they argued. And therefore, because these tasks are not yet socialist, because they are in fact capitalist, a section of the capitalist class will play a progressive role. The progressive section of the national bourgeoisie. This then is the fundamental program of Stalinism. Socialism in one country. A two stage revolution. And the bloc of four classes in alliance with the capitalist class. Now Trotsky and the left opposition, which then organized itself into the fourth international opposed this. And put forward the perspective that in countries of belated capitalist development, the capitalist class was fundamentally incapable of carrying out national and democratic tasks. The capitalists in the Philippines, for example, would not carry out land reform because they're not a separate class from the landlords. All of the big capitalists are the landed elite. And in fact, if you look at a history of the CPP's alliances, a great many of their allies have been the sugar barons. These are not forces with any interest in carrying out land reform. Likewise, they have no interest in national sovereignty. They're tied to international finance capital by 10,000 threads. And thus, the tasks of the National Democratic Revolution can only be carried out by workers leading the peasantry. But to do so, they have to adopt a socialist program. This was the response of Trotsky to Stalinism. Now, having laid out that program, I want to explore what its political manifestation was. Sison quoted Mao in 1967 and told an audience of young people, quote, some people fail to understand why so far from fearing capitalism, communists should advocate its development in certain given conditions. Our answer is simple. The substitution of a certain degree of capitalist development for the oppression of foreign imperialism and domestic feudalism is not only an advance, but an unavoidable process. It benefits the proletariat as well as the bourgeoisie and the former perhaps more. Mao is saying that capitalism is better for the proletariat than it is for the bourgeoisie. It is not domestic capitalism, but foreign imperialism and domestic feudalism, which are superfluous. Indeed, we have too little capitalism. Sison elaborated on this. It is a basic principle of Marxism that bourgeois democratic conditions must first exist before a socialist society can be built up. What we need in the Philippines today is a conscious national unity strong enough to assert our own sovereignty and achieve Filipino democracy before we are divided on the issue of socialism. The perspective of socialism, according to Sison, is it's not yet time for socialism. This is a graphical illustration prepared by the party in a book called Drawing, Tulung sa Pagtuturo, not a big fan of the word drawing, by the way, indicating the block of four classes. On the one hand, we see the enemies, mga kaaway, the U.S. imperialist with Uncle Sam hat, the fat comprador bourgeoisie, and the fat panginoong may lupa, the landlord, and below them, the good guys, mga kaibigan, the friends, Mangagawa, you can see he has a hammer, that's the worker. Magsasaka, he's got a sickle, that's the peasant. Petty Borgesia, he's got glasses, that makes him an intellectual. And Pambansang Borgesia, 
He's skinnier than the uh, the comprador bourgeoisie. He's got a briefcase and you can see the frills on his Baron Tagalog. The point of this is these are allegedly the four progressive classes and it explicitly includes the capitalists. How did this play out? Well, the first progressive representative of the national bourgeoisie during season time as leader of the PKP, along with five other and four other individuals in an executive committee, was just Dado Makapagal. Joma Sison, in 1962, at the end of the year, was brought in to the executive committee of the Partido Comunista en Filipinas, the PKP. Along with him was a trade union leader named Ignacio Laxina. You can see Laxina here. Working through the confidential papers of the U.S. Embassy, I discovered that Laxina was not only a member of the executive committee of the PKP, he was also a regular informant for the CIA representative of the embassy uh, <clears throat> and met with him regularly to inform him of developments within the party. That's the logo of the Lapian Mangagawa, the Workers' Party. One of the more remarkable developments in the 1960s was the foundation of a workers' party known as Lapian Mangagawa. It was an independent party of workers that constituted a merger of all of the trade unions into a political party. Founded in January 1963, such a thing had never existed before. Within seven months, Joma Sison and Ignacio Laxina had merged the newly independent workers' party with the ruling party of President Josdado Macapagal. You can see here the frontispiece to a volume written by Joma Sison, Handbook on Land Reform, written in 1963 to promote the land reform of Josdado Macapagal. It is inscribed to President Macapagal for his relentless struggle to emancipate the Filipino peasant. Now, Macapagal was establishing friendly ties with Sukarno, and both the PKI and the PKP saw this as a step toward non-alignment and thus they proclaimed him the progressive representative of the national bourgeoisie. This was in the midst of a brutal suppression of some of the worst labor unrest in the country's history. In 1963, the port workers, longshoremen, 3,000 of them, went on strike. They were on strike for 169 days, shutting down the port of Manila. Commerce ground to a halt. Workers were murdered on the picket line by both government troops and scabs. Some strikers died of malnutrition because they were not paid strike pay. By mid-August, official estimates placed the business losses which had been incurred from the port strike at over a billion pesos, with more than a month to go. The port was directly controlled by the government. The workers were picketing and striking against the Macapagal regime, not a private company. On August 6, 1963, as Macapagal concluded the Manila summit with Sukarno, Joma Sison and Ignacio Laxina oversaw the merger of the Lapia Mangagawa with the Liberal Party. In a document that was signed by both the LM and the LP, they declared, aware of the epochal social and national reforms now being energetically carried out under the leadership of President Josdado Macapagal, believing that nothing short of the unity of all forces for democratic change can assure the success of these reforms, realizing that the forces opposed to reform programs have banded together under the banner of the Nationalista Party, bear that in mind, they agree to coalesce the parties effectively immediately. All right. Macapagal is carrying out reforms. The bad guys are in the Nationalista Party. We're merging the Independent Workers Party with Macapagal. The workers at the pier were already on strike and had been for two months. Laxina said that he was going to call out a general strike of the entire Lapian Mangagawa in support of the port workers. And then he used this threat to negotiate ties with Macapagal. In early September, while the port strike was still ongoing, Philippine Airlines workers went on strike and shut down all domestic travel. Not only was the port shut down, but all domestic travel in the country was shut down. Josdado Macapagal deployed the Philippine constabulary and they bayoneted the workers on the picket line. September 8, 1963. I doubt if a single person in this meeting knows that these events ever took place. This event has been erased from history 
because those who were responsible for the leadership of the workers' organizations betrayed them. What was Sison busy doing at this time? He was writing the handbook for the land reform of Makapagal. Makapagal's land reform was written by a man named Wolf Ladajensky of the Ford Foundation. The entire task of the land reform was to transform sharecroppers into cash rent paying tenants. Peasants who were interviewed later in the 1960s said that this was a terrible transformation and made their lives worse. Sison wrote the handbook. We know this because he's published it as part of the bibliography on his website. Sison declared, President Justado Macapagal believes that the land problem cannot be solved by merely regulating share tenancy or by coercing a restless peasantry with civilian guards and military operations. In the Agricultural Land Reform Code, the basic solution to the basic problem is provided. Share tenancy is to be totally abolished and owner cultivatorship is to be instituted in its place. To accomplish this principal objective, the code offers a full panoply of implementing land reform agencies whose functions and operations are all revealed in this primer. That's what Joma Sison said in 1963. Unfortunately, the text in my next slide has been transformed somewhat by PowerPoint, but it's largely readable. When Joma Sison wrote Philippine Society and Revolution, which became the most important work of the Communist Party of the Philippines, this is what he had to say about the land reform code that he promoted in 1963. To further make itself appear progressive and to swindle the peasantry, the Makapagal puppet regime enacted the Agricultural Land Reform Code. Like all previous land reform laws, the code amounts to nothing when shorn of its littering, glittering should be, generalities, and when the provisions favorable to landlords are exposed. After a few token land reform projects, the bankruptcy of the code becomes conspicuous. That's 1970. Recall, the support for Duterte is an outright lie to claim that we supported Duterte. Support for Macapagal, Macapagal's land reform served the interests of the landlords and to swindle the peasantry. Sison was the promoter of the land reform code. The handbook of land reform was what was distributed by the Philippine government to, to promote the land reform. And it was authored by a member of the executive committee of the Philippine Communist Party. Progressive section of the national bourgeoisie, part two, Ferdinand Marcos. Joma Sison oversaw the shift in the front organizations of the party from their support of Macapagal, who had proved to be of limited usefulness and turned against Sukarno in 1964, behind Marcos. The support behind Marcos was mobilized on the claim that Marcos would keep the Philippines out of America's war in Vietnam. Lyndon Baines Johnson had reached out to Macapagal in early 1964, asking the Philippines to deploy troops to Vietnam. I want to point out that this was prior to the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Macapagal promised troops. Marcos attacked Macapagal, said, Macapagal is trying to implement dictatorship. This is opposed to our national interests. I know that sounds somewhat funny coming from the lips of Marcos, but this is the rhetoric of the time. On the basis of the claim that Marcos would keep Philippine troops out of Vietnam, Sison, by, no, by November 1965, had instructed Masaka, the peasant organization, Lapian Mangagawa, the workers' organization, and Kabatan Makabayan, the newly founded youth organization, to support Ferdinand Marcos. One week after Marcos was elected, in an interview with Stanley Carnow of the Washington Post, he declared that he would deploy Filipino troops to Vietnam. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read all of the quotes that I've put on the screen. This is Sison's justification for the establishment of ties with Marcos. I will be making these slides as well as I hope this video available and I would encourage you to revisit them. The Capitan Macabayan was founded a year before it was instructed to support Ferdinand Marcos. And in his speech to the founding Congress, Joma Sison said, and this should sound familiar by now, on the side of imperialism are the compradores and the big landlords. On the side of national democracy are the national bourgeoisie composed of Filipino entrepreneurs and traders, the petty bourgeoisie composed of small property owners, students, intellectuals and professionals, and the broad masses of our people composed of the working class, the peasantry to which the vast majority of Filipino youth today belongs. So again, the block of four classes. With the election of Ferdinand Marcos, however, and as a result of global circumstances, not Philippine developments, an immense social crisis was looming. 
Marshall Wright of the US National Security Council sent a confidential memo to Walter Rostow, National Security Advisor, in which he said, it would be nearly impossible to overestimate the gravity of the problems with which our next ambassador to Manila must deal. It has become commonplace for people knowledgeable on the Philippines to predict a vast social upheaval in the near future. There is widespread talk that the current president will be the last popularly elected Philippine chief executive. Many high level American officials consider the Philippines to be the most serious and the most bleak threat that we face in Asia. A social explosion was looming. The response of the ruling class around the globe was a turn to authoritarian forms of rule. There are more than shadows of the present contained here. Social crisis and the rising tide of global authoritarianism, Suharto, Marcos, Pinochet. The entirety of the Filipino ruling elite was oriented to dictatorial forms of rule. There was hardly an individual that was determined to defend democracy. The architecture for police state rule had been written by the United States, which wrote martial law into the Constitution and wrote trial by jury out. And this is what numerous prior presidents, including Macapagal and Garcia and Quirino, had all indicated that they might declare martial law. Why did Marcos succeed where they had failed? He succeeded because of the context, the global context of social crisis that led to the rise of global authoritarianism. If I could use an analogy, the dictatorship that emerged under Ferdinand Marcos was like a game of musical chairs, or as we call it in the Philippines, trip to Jerusalem. All of the ruling elite were engaged in a game circling Malacanang, knowing that when the music stopped, when martial law was imposed, whoever was seated in Malacanang would be dictator. It is in this context that the Sino-Soviet split plays out across the Philippines. One of the most damning indictments of Stalinism is the fact that the vast economies of China and the USSR never merged. The program socialism in one country, I argue, was always a betrayal of Marxism, but you could argue it had a certain logic. There only was one country in which to build socialism. But after 1949, you have multiple countries, each of them building socialism in one country each with their own national interests. And those national interests inevitably diverged. And that divergence turned into a fraternal conflict and that conflict into an armed dispute. And it split communism around the globe. The Soviet Union, situated behind the buffer zone of Eastern Europe and on a fairly stable industrial base, was able to articulate a program of peaceful coexistence with Washington and pursued ties with dictators around the world as a means of stabilizing its diplomatic and trade relations. When Suharto oversaw the crushing of the PKI, murdering nearly over a million in Indonesian communists, workers and peasants, etc., and took power, the Indonesian army had been operating to a certain extent with arms that had been sold to them by the Soviet Union and Moscow established friendly ties with Suharto. Beijing, meanwhile, confronted Taiwan, Japan, the US war in Vietnam, and a dramatically underdeveloped economy. And in an attempt to defuse the threat of US imperialism from its borders in 1965, Lin Biao put forward the line of protracted people's war, armed guerrilla movements throughout the countryside of the world. This was still in service to the program of support for the progressive section of the national bourgeoisie, but it was not to the ruling dictators. It was to, as I like to call them, the conspiring understudies in the drama of dictatorship. Those forces in the Philippines, like Nino Aquino, who sought to displace Marcos, but did not do so in the end in defense of democracy. They did so so that they themselves would be in the position of power, a point that I substantiate in great detail in my doctoral dissertation. The armed movement of the CPP and the persuasive force that its radical rhetoric gave out over social crisis was brought in service to these layers, the conspiring layers of the national bourgeoisie. 
I do not have time to adequately cover much of the material that I still have. I may give a second talk, as a matter of fact, given the enthusiasm that there has been for this one. Let me make a few points. The PKP, oriented to Moscow, entered into the cabinet of the Marcos administration in 1966. They facilitated his negotiations with Moscow, which he could not do democratically because there were reactionary clauses in Philippine law that prohibited him from interacting with communist countries. So he relied on the cadre of the PKP, who were in cabinet positions, to negotiate with Moscow. He, they then had members of their periphery ghostwrite Ferdinand Marcos' justification for martial law, today's revolution democracy. It was written by Adrian Cristobal, who was in the periphery of the Communist Party, and it declared, to Lenin we owe the statement that there could not be revolution without a revolutionary theory. Lenin conceived of the revolution in two steps, first the bourgeois, then the proletarian. That's Stalin, but that's Ferdinand Marcos. The PKP ghost wrote the justification for martial law, pretending that Lenin had put forward Stalin's line and then put these lines in the mouth of the wannabe dictator. What an extraordinary act. Jesus Lava, longtime head of the party, proclaimed that Marcos' book was a brilliant analysis of the ills of Philippine society. I cannot go through these now. There was a debate that went on in the international circles surrounding this. I turn to the next aspect. When Marcos imposed martial law in 1972, a section of the PKP broke away and attempted through armed struggle to oppose this. They had waited far too long to break from the party, something that I elaborate in great detail in my dissertation. But the party was unable to enter into the cabinet of Ferdinand Marcos if there was a section of it that was opposed to martial law, and thus denouncing their opponents as Trotskyites, a language that Stalinists used to murder their opponents. They shot their opponents, executed them. Some of them were shot in their beds. The estimates are hard to come by, but somewhere from 60 to 70 of the cadre of the PKP were murdered by the leadership of the PKP so that they could endorse military dictatorship. The numbers are not clear, but it is safe to say that more communists were killed by the PKP than were killed by the Marcos administration. I cannot go through the logic of why they endorsed the dictator. In the end, it was because he was building the conditions for functioning native capitalism. I'll read one quote. The Philippines is a neo-colonial country of dynamic capitalist development. Its economy is in the main backward and deformed by colonial plunder. Under the hegemony of finance capital, spearheaded by US imperialism, the Philippines is vigorously being transformed from a predominantly feudal country into a modern capitalist economy. Today, it is experiencing a tremendously rapid pace of capitalist buildup through the instrumentality of the martial law dictatorship. Now, if you didn't know it, that doesn't sound like an endorsement from a communist party. International finance capital is developing capitalism through martial law dictatorship. Hooray! This was the endorsement of the PKP's sixth Congress. Every member of the party had to resubscribe to the party and to remain a member. They had to sign on to this political resolution, which endorsed the dictator. The members of the PKP carried out a tremendous political crime. They entered into the administration of the martial law dictatorship. They took up positions in foreign affairs, the labor ministry, and military intelligence, where they were responsible for crushing their rivals, the Maoists. Many of them are still alive. Some of them are still in prominent positions. I'm not going to go into that here. I don't have adequate time, but if you read my doctoral dissertation, their names are there, including a cabinet member of the Duterte administration. The CPP, meanwhile, was oriented to the conspiring understudies of the drama of dictatorship, as I've called them. They held sway over the vast mass movement using the rhetoric of cultural revolution, protracted people's war, etc. They were able to channel this unrest behind their bourgeois allies. I don't have time to go through a good deal of this, but above all, they were allied with Ninoy Aquino, who had facilitated the relations between Aquino, between Sison and Dante at the head of a local armed movement to create the New People's Army. Aquino was responsible for the introductions between Dante and Sison and supplied Dante with a copy of Mao's Little Red Book. I need to say here, this point in my dissertation has been taken out of context by certain Duterte apologists, among them Bobby Tiglao, in the pages of the Manila Times. 
What Tiglao leaves out is the fact that Marcos himself was intimately allied with the Communist Party that facilitated his declaration of martial law. I will not be made to serve as propaganda for the Duterte administration. Aquino himself, however, was not an opponent of martial law. This is a memorandum of the U.S. Embassy, September 12, 1972. Aquino believes that martial law is the most likely means Marcos will use in order to stay in power. Aquino said that he would support Marcos if this is the course that he adopts. Aquino will support Marcos if he declares martial law. Since the law and order and economic situation is deteriorating so rapidly, in Aquino's view, the good of the country requires strong measures on the part of the central government. The growing threat from the dissidents, the worsening law and order problem were cited by Aquino as reasons why stronger central government action is needed. Such action means martial law. Were he president, Aquino indicated that he would not hesitate to take strong action and would, for example, execute several corrupt officials at Luneta Park, public executions, as a lesson to other officials that he meant business. This is not a democratic force. This is the force the party was allied with. In the end, it didn't matter who won. Marcos and the PKP or Aquino and the CPP, regardless, the working class confronted the threat of dictatorship. When dictatorship was finally imposed, Sison said, repression breeds resistance. This is always the line of the party. The worse that fascism is, the better it is for building opposition. This is a fundamental falsehood. Workers have everything at stake in defending democracy. It is what it is, it is the air they breathe for the development of a political movement, but not just that it would develop workers' movements. Sison also stated the task of the party, October 1, 1972, as the party was facing conditions of martial law, the party should win over members of the national bourgeoisie in the cities and in the countryside to give political and material support to the revolutionary movement. Since they themselves cannot be expected to bear arms, oh yeah, we can't expect them to bear arms against the enemy. That's the task of workers and young people. They can extend to the revolutionary movement support in cash or kind, give us money. The party should protect their legitimate interests, protect the interests of capitalists. Mao, meanwhile, went a very different way. Confronting the threat of a possible Soviet invasion in the wake of the crushing of the Prague Spring and the declaration of the Brezhnev Doctrine that the Soviet Union would interfere in the affairs of any, so, any socialist country that threatened Soviet interests. Mao crushed the Cultural Revolution, ostracized Lin Biao, reached out to Nixon and Kissinger and established ties with US imperialism, with Washington. He then turned to countries around the world and like the Soviet Union established relations with dictators. He embraced Marcos. Here we see Imelda Marcos and Mao kissing her hand. He also embraced Pinochet. Allende was tied to the Communist Party of Chile, which was oriented to Moscow. And when Pinochet crushed the Communist Party and the Chilean working class, the Communist Party of China immediately welcomed Pinochet. Sison proclaimed that Mao's diplomacy was a diplomatic victory for the People's Republic of China and a victory for the Philippine revolutionary struggle. The word lies do not begin to encapsulate. Two concluding points because I know I'm running out of time. It is impossible to defend human rights, not simply within these organizations, but on the basis of their political line. They don't represent a defense of democracy. That is my historical summation. The party was responsible for purges within its own ranks that killed a thousand of its own members. It also, as you can see here, I was going to go into this in more detail, recruited child soldiers producing comics and reading primers so that they could recruit children as young as 10 years old and 11 years old to the New People's Army in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Those who are interested in defending human rights need to look elsewhere. This is not that I don't defend the human rights of the CPP and its front organizations. I made that explicitly clear. My point is otherwise. If you are interested in defending democracy, preventing the rise of dictatorship and defending human rights, these are not the social forces that you should be looking to. My final appeal is that to all scholars and to those on this call, the rhetoric of CSUN and company, these are outright lies. He told me that I should wallow in my own saliva. 
the circulation of doctored images. These are the tactics of the far right. The language of the CPP is indistinguishable from the Duterte supporters, the DDS on Facebook. You could do a little, was the, who said it, Joma Sison or a DDS? You'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. They have no interest in defending historical truth. I would like to conclude by quoting what Trotsky said about the Stalinists in this regard. With every zig and zag, they are compelled to revamp history all over again. They allied with Macapagal, but then he was reactionary. They allied with Marcos, but then of course he was reactionary. This occurred again and again. They allied with Cori Aquino, but then she was reactionary. The lie serves therefore, Trotsky continues, as the fundamental ideological cement of the bureaucracy. It's what holds the whole thing together. The more irreconcilable becomes the contradiction between the bureaucracy and the people. All the ruder becomes the lie. I think we're witnessing that now. All the more brazenly is it converted into criminal falsification and judicial frame up. Don't rely on what's being said at present. Find the contemporary written record. It is the only thing that we can be certain is accurate. Check it for yourself. Review the evidence for yourself. And this applies not just to my own field, but to scholars in general. We are in a period where historical truth, the very idea of truth is under challenge and where authoritarian figures are riding the world over on the basis of outrageous lies. I am speaking in defense of civil discourse, of democratic and public discussion, of evidence, of arguments, and of the defense of democracy and historical truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, for the very uh, informative and passionate talk. I think we're running um, out of time, but still, do you still want to take a, a couple questions or we just stop here? I would love to take a couple questions as long as the audience is still with me. Yeah, maybe we'll just uh, take a, I, I see actually uh, a big number of questions coming in, but uh, probably we cannot go completely democratic and to answer everybody's questions. But um, um, let me see, I, I saw this question which came uh, rather early and I think uh, probably some other attendees also want to know. So here comes the question, in light of the ongoing crisis and the fragmentation of the left, not just here in the Philippines, but wor worldwide, can you provide a sketch on how to deal with the ongoing demise of the liberal state and the surging populist tide with both variants found in the left and the right. So this, this is actually, uh, there are a few questions wrapped in the big question. So yeah, do you want- uh, I would love to address that, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, it's a marvelous question. And honestly, I could, a number of people could speak on this topic for a considerable period of time. So I'm going to give you bullet points. Uh, the first is this, um, Duterte is a political type. Duterte has his political siblings around the world, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, political parties such as the AFD in Germany and so on. What we're dealing with is a global phenomenon. And so the first point for those who are concerned with the rise of authoritarianism is this is not a national problem. Our solutions cannot be national solutions. This requires a global political perspective, a, a profound interaction between people around the globe workers, scholars, etc., in defense of truth and in opposition to the rise of authoritarianism. The second, you spoke of the fragmentation of the left. I, I understand the concern, but my paramount concern is the fragmentation of the working class, the fragmentation of the social force that can put an end to the danger of dictatorship and can defend democracy. And it is fundamentally a question of the unity of the working class. And if my historical assessment of the history of the Philippines is correct, it's a question of the independence of the working class. Its own interests, not the interests of allying with this or that section of the capitalist class. Um, now that's a very clear political conclusion that I'm drawing from this historical record. But in the end, the fragmentation of the left, I think, is less a concern than the fragmentation of the working class along national lines.
2023? Thank you. That is a long question and I cannot possibly do justice to it. It's a loaded question that contains a number of things, including I think the presumption that I speak for Trotskyists. Uh, I'm speaking here as a historical scholar. Uh, I have put forward a Trotskyist analysis and I can put forward what I believe is a perspective that a Trotskyist will agree with. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not speaking in a political so much as in a scholarly capacity here. That said, what is what is what function would this movement have? The, the task of the movement isn't again to reach out to other sections of the so-called left, but to articulate the interests of the working class. To, in the words of Lenin in 1903, uh, to patiently explain to the working class and to honestly explain the task that history has posed before them. The only other point that I'll make, I don't think I can really do justice to your question right now. I'd like to see this question and answer session uh, perhaps turned into an entire seminar. I think it would be very interesting uh, because I feel like I'm skimming across the surface. But uh, those who are looking in the Philippines for an alternative are not starting from scratch. I think this is a really important point. The Philippines has a rich, proud heritage of revolutionary struggle. A revolutionary movement to overthrow Spanish colonialism, a protracted and courageous fight against American imperialism at great sacrifice, and a series of uprisings and organizings, labor struggles such as the port strike that I documented. All of this is the rich history of the Filipino people, of the Filipino workers and peasants. Any new movement builds off this history, learns from this history, but it doesn't just build off of this. You don't start with the national boundaries. You start on the existing movement of workers around the world. And this, I think, is anyone in the Philippines looking to build a new movement should be looking to their brothers and sisters around the world for their political ideas, for their organization. That's what we build off of. Okay. Yes, sorry, I, I think I just muted myself. So when I was reading out the, the question, probably some of you didn't hear me, but I've published the question um, in, in this uh, live event Q&A. So if you're still interested, you can read the questions. So I also published another question and think probably I think a lot of people like this question, probably also want to know the answer. Based on the tenets of Marxism and Leninism, is Joma Sison a true blue communist? If yes, how come? If not, uh, then why call their party as the so-called communist party of the Philippines when in fact he is a Maoist? Is this not a case of misrepresentation? Thank you, Thank you for a wonderful question. Um, yes and no, historically both. Uh, so is Joma Sison a communist in the sense of the communist manifesto? or in the sense of the Communist Party that took power in October 1917? No, he is not. He does not bear that legacy. But it is the betrayal of Stalinism that assumed the mantle of this legacy, that presented itself as the continuation of Marxism, that allows him to be a member of the Communist Party purporting to be the continuator of this. And in fact, it is his greatest political capital that he can point to this history and say this is his. It is not. The history that is his is the history that I have outlined. And so, no, he does not represent the continuation, continuation of Marxism, but he does represent the continuation of Stalinism. And I think we'll wrap up with that um, because there are a number of questions that I think deserve more time. I don't want to give these rushed answers that I feel I'm compelled to give. I will be making this video available. I will be making the slides available. I will organize another talk. I will be delivering another lecture, in fact, in a week and a half on a somewhat perhaps less controversial topic, the uh, support that Manila gave to Indonesia in its opposition to the formation of Malaysia during the period known as Confrontasi. It is actually in its own way also a controversial topic, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. I think um, if you have any further questions, I've received a, a well, overwhelming number of questions, but I will send those questions to Joseph. But if you still like to stay in touch, you can you feel free to send him an email and right, you can continue as Joseph just said, and he will probably uh, conduct another few lectures and seminars so we can continue the conversation. But thank you so much for your time. And um, if you're interested, please stay tuned with our 
the rest of the postdoc series and uh, you will receive updates if you're interested. Thank you so much. Have a good, yeah, have a good evening. Bye.